Hello from our Walsingham studio, and welcome to our programme, Great Britain in Focus. I'm James McCullough. For the 2019 SPUC Youth Conference, the EWTN GB team travelled to Milton Keynes to cover the event. As the future of the church lies in the hands of the youth, we speak to the leader of a youth mission team reaching out to young Catholics. Our correspondent, Graham Draper, interviews an eminent Christian physicist from the University of York on his journey to faith and his latest book. And as Catholics celebrate our Blessed Mother in the month of May, Father Jared Mary Tomin gives a spiritual reflection on Our Lady for her special month. The importance of the work done to protect life cannot be understated. EWTN recently covered the 2019 SPUC Youth Conference held in Milton Keynes. Dr Anthony McCarthy speaks to Catholic bioethicist Fiorella Nash and medical doctor and philosopher Dr Callum Miller discussing the pro-life movement and difficulties encountered in the medical profession. Hello, I'm Dr. Anthony McCarthy, and I'm very pleased to be joined by uh, Dr. Callum Miller and Fiorella Nash. Uh, I'm the author of uh, Ethical Sex and Abortion Matters, and I work for uh, SPUC, amongst other things. Fiorella Nash is an internationally acclaimed author of uh, novels, but most lately of The Abolition of Women, and is uh, a pro-life feminist. We'll be speaking a little more about that later. And Dr. Callum Miller is the rather wonderful combination of a medical doctor and a philosopher. Um, uh, a rare and a great thing, I think uh, it's fair to say. So we're going to begin by discussing uh, a very simple question, but also a very complex question. Why pro-life? Um, Fiorella, you've written in this area. Could you explain your thoughts about these terms and uh, why you would call yourself pro-life? Well, I think it's an unfortunate that the term pro-life has become such a cliché and it's got so much baggage associated with it because really it's a very simple concept. Um, certainly f for me as a pro-life feminist, if we believe in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we must believe in the right to life. It is the foundational right without which all other rights are meaningless. So it's seems to me to be self-evidently true that we should be pro-life, everyone should be pro-life. Do you think that the term captures, uh, encapsulates anything else? Yeah, I guess it's, it's a slightly strange term in that most people I think would call them, well, would, <laughs> would be in favour of life. I guess it's, yeah, essentially the question is life, I guess what philosophers call the margins of life, the beginning and end of life, these kind of more controversial areas where, from my perspective, I'd want to affirm that actually at the margins of life, life still matters, whether it's in the middle or at the end, no matter how successful it's been, no matter how independent people are, life matters all the time. And as a doctor especially, I want to preserve it and I want to help people enjoy life and enjoy life to the full. I, mean, I think it's certainly the case, I, I, I would feel, that coming at this from a social justice perspective, which is very much how I entered the pro-life movement, that it's very easy to be pro-life if it's a life that's not that significant to you and that is not really your responsibility. It's easy to campaign against uh, poverty, for example, or against warfare in another country. But the sort of issues we deal with, abortion, euthanasia, they, uh, they affect the daily lives of millions of people all over the world and they involve sacrifices and responsibilities, perhaps, that maybe isn't quite so much the case in other spheres. I mean, I've always thought that um, when we think about pro-life, what we're saying in the specific context of abortion is an absolute opposition to the deliberate killing of, uh, in this case, an innocent unborn child. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a moral absolute, which is a negative. Uh, and in a sense, what we're saying in saying pro-life is that we fundamentally hold to that, an absolute opposition to killing being uh, employed in this way, which is essentially treated now as a sort of private autonomous decision. When you say that you're 
pro-life, that presumably that you encounter a whole lot of different ranges of uh, attitudes and emotions. I mean, could you expand on some of those, say, you might encounter in the medical profession? For me, it's fundamentally about egalitarianism, about saying all humans are equal. And actually, if all humans are equal, then we can't kind of make excuses for taking the lives of some unless we start making excuses for taking the lives of others. And actually, I think most people would say, no matter what you can gain from killing someone, no matter if it's expedient or if it's kind of something that helps achieve equality, no matter the benefit you can gain, actually there's just a fundamental right to life. And if all humans really are equal, and it doesn't depend on their intellectual capability or their economic status or even their relationship to other people, then it seems like we should just apply the same logic. It's essentially just a case of human equality for me. Now in the case of medicine, you know, you see all sorts of other perspectives and medicine has become quite pro-choice in terms of what many people think. But I think there is a real ambivalence about it. So most doctors I think would probably say they support a substantial though limited right for a woman to choose to have an abortion. So they say they think that should be legal. But actually if you look at their practice, most doctors wouldn't do it. And if you look at surveys asking medical students and doctors, would you perform an abortion for this reason? Actually, most of them wouldn't. And I think my fear, and I don't think this is really spoken about enough, is what actually happens to a person who performs an abortion, mm. what actually happens to that person's um, mental state, what happens to their soul, dare I say it. Uh, we talk a lot about abortion in terms of the woman's decision, uh, her conversation with the doctor, um, the right to choose, the right to bodily integrity, wh however you wish to phrase it. But in the end, someone has to do it. Mm. Someone has to perform it. Um, and whether it's inserting the needle or prescribing the tablets, a third party has to take the moral responsibility for that. And I think we are not examining enough what is happening to the medical profession by being burdened with that. Yeah. Working in the medical profession, I. I encounter a lot of people who think doctors should have to do this. Mm. And polls suggest that one in five people in the UK think doctors should be forced to perform abortions as well. And like you say, the, the effects on it often aren't appreciated. There is some research on it, but it's you know very rarely publicized. And, and it does show that it, it takes its toll. And that's why you see some people who work in abortion clinics or who work in abortion services in the NHS end up just quitting and they say they, they can't do it once they've seen the reality of it. Even sometimes people who have done it for many years, one day they just think, actually, this is just a baby and they stop. And I think if those people who really see the reality and who have lived on that for years, and that's their, their livelihood for many years, if they say, actually, this just is a baby and this is wrong, that's something we should really listen to. In our youth segment, Catherine Williams from the Diocese of East Anglia Youth Mission Team speaks about the difficulties young people face and about different events which are available to young Catholics in Great Britain and abroad to help them feed their faith. Welcome, Catherine, to our studio. Thank you for having me. So, as a member of the, or team leader of the youth mission team, um, I wanted to ask you, what did you think was the state of the faith of the Catholic youth today in the UK? Okay, so, I mean, that's a really interesting question. Um, we're living in a very secularised country, um, mm -hmm. I guess, and I know, for example, in the Diocese of East Anglia, you know, you've got three and a half percent of the population actually say that they're Catholic. So, you know, you're working very, uh, yeah, I mean, we are a bit the exception here because we're very rural. But True. yeah, you're certainly working um, in a very secularised country um, mm. and, you know, it's also very relativistic. So you mentioned that the relativism is a, uh, an obstacle to the faith because there are so many different ideas out there about religion and how you practice faith. But in addition, I imagine from what you're just saying about how many, there's so many distractions for people which could take them away from focusing on faith. Yeah. So whether it's social media and their social lives or sport or 
TV, etc., then those are the things which are competing with their time and focus and attention for faith. Absolutely, as you say. I mean, weekends, for example, very much mm. given over towards extracurricular things. Um, and yeah, it can be difficult, especially it's sort of both a blessing and I guess a downside is, you know, we live in a world where there's so many things available, mm. but it's about really prioritising those things and figuring out, okay, you know, what actually matters to me. And I was very blessed to live in a family which prioritised faith. Um, but not everybody is blessed to have that in that same way. Um, so it can be really difficult to kind of find those priorities, um, particularly as a young person, when you don't have friends necessarily who um, have, share that faith with you. Um, and yeah, it can be difficult to sort of sure. find ways to prioritise that, yeah. Okay. So what is being offered to Catholic youth in the UK in order to strengthen their faith? There's a lot of signs of hope um, okay. in this country. And even just from when I was, um, I'm still a young person, <laughs> but mm. um, you know, when I was younger, when I was a teenager, um, and to now how there is more stuff there, there's more things you can go to, there's more events being run. And also more events appealing to kind of Catholics all across the spectrum. So mm -hmm. from people who are a bit unsure about their faith, who might be really sort of questioning, okay, the basics, like does God even exist? To mm -hmm. those who, okay, I, you know, I want to be a saint, how do I grow in holiness? <laughs> so there's stuff sort of like all across the board there in terms of events, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you've got things like Keith 2000, which is aimed at people who are slightly older, so all young adults. Um, okay. You have things like Flame, which are for everybody across the board and definitely more for those people on the periphery, something more evangelistic. Um, right. Then you've got things like The Ascent, so a really intensive three-year discipleship course for people who really are looking to develop their faith. So it's that really fantastic good. what is out there when you look for it. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> those are all national events, I take it? They are national, yes. Okay, and then anything on the sort of uh, international stage? So in terms of the international events, the biggest one you probably think of is World Youth Day. So sure. that's huge. Yeah. You get millions of people going every few years. Mm. Um, I went to the one in Poland um, a few years mm. ago and, you know, three and a half million people, about. Wow. Estimates vary. But, yeah. you know, really amazing to kind mm. of see, okay, these are people my age from all over the world um, here to pray here to grow closer to God. The amazing thing about World Youth Day, for example, is that being part of something bigger than yourself and really seeing the church on this international level. So really getting to experience, okay, you know, it's not just me. I'm part of something so much bigger. I'm part of a church which is you know, really fully universal mm. and, you know, one as well. Um, so let's now focus just briefly on one of those events, the national event. You took some people down to the Flame Congress Absolutely, in London. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that. So Flame is a really fantastic event which started um, a few years ago and mm. they run it every few years. It's designed to kind of fill the gap between the major World Youth Days which happen once every three years. Um, yeah. So yeah, we took um, a few coach loads down to Wembley um, for Flame and really amazing event. It's very, as I said earlier, it's really evangelistic, it's really designed for those people who are on the peripheries, those people who might be kind of questioning their faith a bit, a bit uncertain. And it really is designed to draw those people in and to see the faith in an authentic way really. Um, mm -hmm. And to see actually, you know, you know, there's um, more to sort of expression of faith actually and right. time of adoration. So that time to actually personally encounter Christ within the day, um, arguably the most important thing. I remember the first time I went to a Catholic um, event myself and I was quite shy when I was mm. younger. But actually, you know, that was the most rewarding thing. And it really, I can see now with the benefit of hindsight, how that really influenced my faith journey and okay. led me to where I am today. Yeah. Great. Okay, well, it sounds like there's a lot of hope for the future anyway. There is, absolutely. Catherine, thanks very much. It's good to speak to you. Thank you, James. The relationship between faith and science is often presented in a negative light and the source of much confusion. Our correspondent, Graham Draper, speaks to eminent physicist Professor Tom McLeish in the first of a series of interviews clearing up misconceptions about science and faith. He aims to bring us to a deeper understanding of creation, inspiring our faith in a transcendent God who reveals himself in scripture and the natural world. Hello, my name is Graham Draper and we are very glad to have Tom McLeish with us today. Tom is 
a professor of theoretical physics. He is a fellow of the Royal Society and a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry and a fellow of the Institute of Physics. And he currently holds the chair of natural philosophy at the University of York. He is the author of a number of books, including Faith and Wisdom in Science and his recent release, The Poetry and Music of Science. Tom, it's really, really great to have you with us. Graham, it's lovely to be here. Thank you. So could you tell us about your road to God and to Christianity? What was your journey like? I've certainly always been convinced that science sits not on its own, but within what we, I would now call a metaphysical environment of an interpretation and narrative of, 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 uh, of wider questions of purpose. Um, and, you know, I, I have a bit of an unusual, um, uh, I suppose, reason for the road to Christianity or Christian faith, um, which is that I remember as a young adult wanting to understand uh, why there was evil. Now, funny enough, I realize now it's often a reason quoted by people not to believe in, in, in a God, the sense of evil. For me, it was the road to theism at first, and then particularly to Christian faith. And, and then I suppose the other appreciation that the Christian specific story had this incredibly wonderful arc. It was historically embedded. It has a beginning and a middle and an end. It has, um, uh, and, and embedded throughout this, this is the miracle of redemption, that even the worst things can lead to healing and can be reshaped in God's hands. And so it was, I suppose, the combination of the sort of metaphysical evil and the, the personal correspondence of that, the experience of forgiveness um, and the historical arc in which the incarnation is to be is to be found. That was my road to road to Christian faith. I also have a bit of theological background as well. I'm in the Anglican Church called a lay reader, and we have a, uh, a three-year training of theology and church practice and church history, much like ordained people do. Um, and that I found extremely, uh, extremely helpful and enormously helpful in thinking through what science means theologically. So, Tom, you, you've written a lot about the purpose of science in the divine plan, and the nature of the beauty of the natural world uh, and the interaction between science and wisdom and faith in your book, Faith and Wisdom in Science. So could you tell us about that? Really happy to, yeah. Um, so I suppose the, the motivation for, uh, for the book um, came from a number of sources. Uh, one was my so sadness that science wasn't um, really perceived widely as a cultural good. And it doesn't start with theology, actually. It starts with, with um, being painfully aware that uh, science isn't seen as that common human, in that human basket of creative attributes in which we might put theatre or telling stories or music or song or um, cave paintings. But I think it should. So it was it was um, a desire to trace some of the older, the very ancient tributaries of the river we call science, if you like. And then secondly, um, the theology and science discourse that I was aware of uh, had really circulated around apologetics. I felt the whole narrative was on the back foot, too much, far too much on the, on, on, on the, on the back foot of answering the question, um, yeah, uh, how do you reconcile science with theistic or Christian belief? Um, and then I suppose thirdly, I, I felt that the, the theology and science literature could do with a good, a much deeper dive into scriptural resource. And as a, a young Christian awaking to theological, to the application of, of our whole mind to faith, when I read the book of Job, I realized that I had never read anything like this, and this was a wellspring of almost infinite depth. Um, it's interesting, I've recently discovered just how, how many um, philosophers have commented on Job. I think if we're, I haven't done this exercise yet, but if I plotted out the, uh, the, the, the frequency with which mainstream philosophy has engaged with biblical texts, absolutely convinced there'd be a massive spike on Job. Almost everyone has, you know, Levinas, Kant, uh, Basil the Great, I mean, every, everyone talks about Job. Um, and the Lord's answer to Job, 
um, I think is one of the most, probably the most outstanding ancient nature texts um, ever, ever written. However you interpret it, it is a series of 168, I think, questions. Um, were you there when I laid the foundations of the world? Of Yahweh to Job? Do you know whereabouts are the storehouses of ice? How is it that Pleiades are bound together in a tight cluster while the stars of Orion are dispersed? How does the hawk navigate to the south? These are questions, real questions, about the scientific fields we now call zoology and ge uh, geology, meteorology, astronomy. And that's not being anachronistic about this. It indicates that there really is... Um, someone wrote this. Uh, and there's a deep questioning insight into nature. And the fact that that engagement with the natural world is in the context of pain is in the context of moral outrage that nature appears to be out of control um, that I find even more interesting. So my, um, uh, but my, my two favorite comments on, 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 on the Faith of Wisdom and Science book were from one friend who said, Tom, this isn't really a science and religion book at all, is it? It's a book saying how great science is and how deep and long the history of science is. Yep, that's it. Uh, and the second, absolutely delightful response was the uh, the library that I discovered has filed this book under commentaries on the book of Job. So the central passage is, is the book of Job. And then after that, what I tried to do is to tease out from the biblical wisdom material what a theology of science might look like, but also try and see all that within a New Testament lens and try and encapsulate within, um, within a, New, a New Testament theology what a theology of science might look like. For centuries, the Catholic Church has set aside the month of May to honour the Mother of God. We join Father Jared Mary Toman as he reflects on the Annunciation, God's love for Mary and her role in salvation history. The Annunciation speaks to us firstly of the love and the fatherliness of God. By observing the wonder of the scene, we come to a profound understanding that God is gracious and courteous and that he never forces or manipulates. Instead, God's ways of involving us in his saving work is through invitation. What is brought out into wonderful magnificence in the Annunciation is the mystery of who God is in himself, the Blessed Trinity. In the little holy house in Nazareth, Mary is presented to us as the daughter of the Father, the mother of the Son, and the spouse of the Holy Spirit, through whom she will conceive, making of her virginal body a desert in full bloom. The Annunciation makes clear that God is never absent from us, nor is he ever indifferent towards us, but rather that he has a predestined plan for his holy people. A plan which, owing to his goodness and generosity, has been written so as to intimately involve each one of us. Through the Annunciation, we learn to imitate Mary, who is perfect in all virtue. Here we are taught most especially the beauty of the virtue of patience. For God's holy, loving and perfect will is only revealed when the appointed time dawns. In her family home, the young Mary received her heavenly guest, the Archangel Gabriel, who addressed her in the following words, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Revealed here is the first burning torch testifying to Our Lady's Immaculate Conception, a sacred teaching of the Holy Catholic faith, which, when the right time had blossomed, would be dogmatically defined in 1854. 
by Pope Blessed Pius IX. Although we, unlike the Blessed Virgin, have always borne the wound of Adam's fall, resulting in the daily battle we must wage against the attraction we find in sin, we can still, nevertheless, draw sure comfort and hope from those flickering heavenly moments of the Annunciation. For here the eternal word took flesh, the true light of our salvation dawned, and through the sacred wounds that Christ would one day suffer, we find our healing. Mary never harboured any desire other than for God and for his holy will to be done in her, through her and around her. As the mother of God, we ask for her prayers so that we too may foster a prayerful watchfulness in our lives. By meditating upon the Annunciation and by being inspired by Mary's example, we are imbued with the resolute desire to offer to God the gift of a pure, receptive and listening heart. We learn also how to make a fitting and worthy response to the revelation of God's holy will in our own lives. In so many ways, therefore, the Annunciation teaches us that God, our Creator, always takes the initiative and that he is the eternal and living source of all that is good, holy, beautiful and true. Here we discover that all we have to do as children of God through our baptism is to respond to his loving voice with complete openness, surrendering all that we have to him who has first given us everything we possess. As Our Lady uttered and entrusted God with her fiat, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. So too, each one of us are invited to say to God with an unconditional openness and trust, Here I am, Lord. I am completely yours. May your holy, loving and perfect will be done forever perfectly in me. Until next time, may God bless, protect and keep you. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Full versions of these interviews will be available on our website, ewtn.co.uk. Tune in next month for new stories in our next episode of Great Britain in Focus. And remember, we rely on your support and generosity to keep bringing you new content. From our team in Walsingham, God bless and goodbye.